So before, we had one variable that measures the rate of change. Is this still a rate of change? Yes. But if you had a specific point, before it was, what happens as x increases? But now what do we have? What happens as x increases and what happens as y increases? Eventually, what do we get to do? How many directions could I go in if I was on a surface that's like going different directions, like bubbling or whatever you want to say? If I'm standing on a point, how many different directions could I walk in? An infinite number of directions. So what are we looking at first? Well, what happens as we go in the x direction? Or what happens as we go in the y direction? Eventually, will we talk about any direction? Sure. If you're standing on the side of a mountain, it might be that steepness going this way. It might be that steepness going that way. It might be that steepness going this way. It could be different in every direction. It could be the same. Wow. So we need to be very, very, very careful about the analysis. As long as you are careful about the details, the work is pretty sh over on the left. It is. The location of that value is what? 2, 1. So the, temp the temperature at 2, 1 is what? 135. We might want to know this, and we might want to know that. What does that little sub x mean? The, the change in temperature with respect to x. The change in temperature with respect to y. This is what's really important. If it's with respect to x, it means that x is changing. So what's fixed? y. This means y is changing, so what's fixed? X. X. You have to be very, very careful about this. The easiest way to mess this up is to fix the wrong thing. So using colors in this tabular example here, say I use purple right here for x, if x is what's changing, what's fixed again? Y. So if I fix y, there you go. What about if I, fi so if I fix x for this one right here? If I fix x, it's those numbers I'm looking at, the rate of change, the rate of change. So when you're talking about a rate of change, we're still finding slope effectively, right? Now, when you were an AB calculus and you had tabular data like this, you might have had a few ways to come up with the estimate for the derivative. We don't, do we, is there a stated function for this? So can we find out a rate of change exactly? So could your answers differ a little bit if I ask you this? So this is, what's the rate of change with respect to x at 2, 1? Again, what are we fixing if, if the x is changed? We're fixing y. So if we fix y right here, there's a couple ways to think about it. You're doing the slope of the tangent line right here, right? That's what you're looking for. Now, you can estimate either by taking these two points, these two points, or these two points. Which two do you think the book prefers and you think I prefer? What? Did you say it? Someone just said it. So option one, option two, option three. Option three. Take one point before and one point after. Exactly. So you're doing the rate of change of the temperature with respect to x. So x, is so x is changing. So if it's the rate of change of temperature for this one, what difference should I put on top? What subtraction do I do on top? 160, yep, minus. And then what's on the bottom? What subtraction is on the bottom? 3 minus? Nope. Remember, we're going before, right before or right after. So it's 3 minus what? 1. So this is 32 over 2. So it's what? 16. And I think the units in this are degree per meter. What's the difference, though, if I do ty? If I do ty, what am I going to subtract here? 155 minus 120 over what? 0 minus 2. You have to do the same order of subtraction, right? You have the slope between two points. So what's this going to be? 35 over negative 2. So it's negative 17 degrees per, 17.5 degrees per meter. Does that visual representation of the tabular version of this data make sense? You are fixing the y value on the purple. You are fixing the x value on the, what is that, a green? <laughs> I think it's green. Are you, are you OK with what I just put on the board right there? Five, yes, zero, absolutely not. Where are you with that? You okay, like four, five-ish? Fixing the proper variable is the key. If you want to fix your mind on something, what is static? Ask yourself that. You're going to do that a lot. So just like there was an AB calculus, when you guys didn't know what a derivative was, when you first started doing derivatives, you might have made a table of values. Remember doing that? You're like, what does it look like it's getting close to 0.9? looking like it goes to 1 is very different than proving that it goes to 1. Similarly, we will do ratios. The 
limit of ratios can't, the limit definition of derivative still applies. Again, if it's fx, so if the partial of f with respect to x, what's changing? x, what's fixed? Y. So look over here. What's changing in the definition right here? What is that? That's the x is changing. What about right here? What's this? That's the y is changing. So can you do these using a limit definition? Yes, and that's what they asked you to do on some of the homework questions. Now, do you remember what the order was? You do tables, and then you do limit definition, and then you guys would get really angry and frustrated because you're like, I don't want to do nasty limits. They're really annoying, but I have to because my teacher tells me. And then all of a sudden, the teacher would be like, here's some differentiation rules. And you're like, yeah. You have done limit definition before, and it is a direct extension in three dimensions of what you did in two dimensions. It's a direct extension. It is plug and chug. Things cancel. It is very, 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 very similar. It is very, very similar. So you need to be able to do that. You need to be able to do that. We'll go back and do an example in a second, but I wanted to make sure you understood this. How many different ways can you state a partial derivative? A bunch of different ways. There are unfortunately a lot of different ways to state the same thing. So you need to be OK with the notation. You need to be OK with the notation. Here are some ways to state pretty much the same thing. This means the partial at that point. That's all it means. You can also do it. You know what that three letters called? Anybody? Yeah, well. <laughs> six. <He's not> gonna, <laughs> backward six. <laughs> like backward six. That's what you can think of it as. You're going to need to practice kind of doing that. I, when I, I don't say gamma. I say partial. I just say partial. It helps me emphasize the fact that there are more than two variables. It helps me emphasize the fact that there are more than two variables. So you could have a table. You could, like you had on the homework, have a picture. And this is, I think, the most important one to really put there. The shadow of that blue pass is that red line at the bottom. This is y equals a constant. So y is not changing right there. OK, yeah, I just thought that that was. Yeah, so in this case, fx, oh, look, it's negative. Well, what about over here? Oh, what's fixed here? The x value is fixed. Again, what's the derivative here? Positive or negative? Negative. It's be negative. Now, you will be asked questions where you'll be given a table of values, and you can estimate the actual numeric value of the derivative. Does this give you any values of numbers to work with right here? No. If I asked you to describe the derivative here, you might estimate, oh, it's about negative one, right, <laughs> if you drew a picture. But the point is, you need to be able to look at a picture and get a general sense of, is it really negative, a little bit negative, zero, a little bit positive, or really positive. There's basically f like five different places you can estimate visually. I try to print out things in color when I'm asking you these questions so that you can see the blue surfaces and the, the black axes. It takes a little while. It takes, if I drew that and it was perpendicular, sorry, if it looked like it was perpendicular, yeah, it would be zero. But what happens if I, let's say I put P right over here. What's it gonna be now? What's the partial, we'll call that P2. Uh, DZ uh, partial X at P2. What was that gonna be? Negative, positive, or zero? Or negative. It's negative because what's the tangent line look like? Looks like that. You see what I mean? Yeah. Now over here, <laughs> it's interesting. When I clip this out, it looks like a good example. The problem is if the points are really close to tops or like it's really hard to estimate, right? So assuming, let's just say that this is the top right there, assuming it's over there in that quadrant, what does it look like the derivative is still going to be right here for the partial of z with respect to x as x gets bigger right here at q? What is it? it looks like it's going to be what? Negative. And as you move closer to, as this point moves closer up, it gets closer to zero because it gets flatter up here. So you need to be able to understand what the pictures look like. But the big thing, Nate, you see that line I drew right at the base here? Yeah. I, draw the, I draw those in all the time because we're going to have to get real, real careful about that because here's the thing. In single variable calculus, you did first derivatives and? Second derivatives. Will we be doing multivariable second derivatives? Yes, absolutely. And the thing is, are there a few of them? Yes, there are. Yes, there are. And they mean lots of fun. Right there, I would, if it was me, I'd be doing 2 minus negative 1, negative one over five minus, 5 minus 0. So it's going to be 3 over 5. Take 3 and b is equal to 2. Do this limit for me and tell me what you get. Let's do this carefully. It's going to be the limit as h goes to 0 of the function a plus h. So it's going to be f of 3 plus h, right? Comma 2 minus f of 
3, 2, all over h. So now you just do fill in the blank stuff and be careful about filling it in. F of, so that's going to be 3 plus h squared over 3 minus, what's f of 3, 2? What, 9 over 3 all over h. Hey, do we have a common denominator up top? Woohoo, we do. Sweet. So what do we end up with here? Let's keep going down. The limit as h goes to 0 of 3 plus h squared minus 9 over, I'll just call it 3h. What do we have to do at this point to this limit? What algebraic step do we, algebraic step do we have to take? Yeah, multiply it out. You have to multiply it out. So you end up with a limit as h goes to 0 of, well, 3 squared is. So you have 9 plus 6h plus h squared minus 9 all over what? h. Oh, what's the magical thing that cancels? It really helps us. Well, the 9s. Not, it's helpful that the 9s go away, but yes. And you really get to the heart of it by saying the h, because if that h was around, we'd be in trouble. Where am I, what am I missing? Oh, it's 3. I did that in the last class, too. I don't know why. So we have 6h plus h squared over. So that's the limit as h goes to 0 of 6 plus h over, which is what? 2. 2. Could you do the same thing for fy? Could you do the same thing for fy? Oh, I'm sorry. This I breathed on it apparently and it's having a conniption and still recording and it's great that's nice I'm gonna pause it there we go actually ah, who knows we'll see if we actually get a recording nice okay so it is recording now so if you do out the other one you will get a number so is this a longer version of what you could use absolutely there's a shorter version now if I stated, do you remember making tables for finding limits? Like you get within 0.5, and then you get within 0.1, and then you get within 0.01, and it gets closer and closer. Remember doing tables like that? This example works you through, but we're not going to do it. But you need to be aware that you could be asked, get really close. So in this case, it's just telling you this corresponds to the h value. Basically, use a calculator. Why do you have to use a calculator to come up with a numeric answer for this? <laughs> yeah, do you know what like e to the negative like 1.1 is? No, you don't. You really don't. You really, really don't. OK, so with respect to x, what do you keep constant? y is what? Constant. So if you keep y constant, treat it as a constant and just do a derivative with respect to x. Anybody want to venture what the answer to this one is? What's the derivative? Of, what's d dx of x squared? What's it over? Y is constant. If I asked you in single variable calculus, <laughs> f of x is equal to x squared over 9, what does f prime equal? 2x over 9. Go back over here. Same thing. In this case, because x is moving, y is not, what do you keep constant? Y. What would be f, a little, little harder, not much, What's constant here? X is constant, right? So you have to do the derivative, and I'll help you here. This is equal to x squared times y plus 1 to the negative 1. Anybody want to tell me what the partial with respect to y is going to be equal to? Negative. To the? Done. X squared, X was the constant in that case. X was the constant. Go back over here. Let's say G was equal to 7 X plus 1 to the negative 1. What's the derivative? Negative 7 X plus 1 to the? Same thing, except instead of 7, what do we have? X squared. In the case where X is constant, it's a constant. Ready? Say it on 3. 1, 2, 3. It's a constant. It's a constant. It is super easy to mess this up because you have a strong comprehension-based comprehension gravity towards seeing variables and thinking they're changing and moving, right? But when you take partials of multivariable functions, only one thing is going to be changing. So all the rules of single variable calculus apply. You just have to be real careful about what is constant, what is fixed. Please sit.
Fish. What's fx going to be? x is moving, so what's the answer to this one going to be? 3. Thanks for putting the coefficient out front. That's helpful. What about the next one, fy? What's that one going to be? Yeah, nice. OK, let's bump it up a little bit. Do b for me. Same thing. Do it by your So zx of xy, x is changing. So what do you drop to the front first? So 5, 3xy plus 2x to the fourth. But what rule is, are we dealing with right now? What's the overall chain rule? So we have to differentiate the inside with respect to x. So what is it going to be? 3 plus do I, zy xy is 5, 3xy plus 2x to the times what? 3x. Anything else? No, because 2x respect to y when you're differentiating is zero. OK, ready for more fun? Are you ready? Ready? Go. If I'm going to do g, if I'm going to do gx, so partial g, partial of g with respect to x, what variable is in motion? x. So what are we keeping constant? It's really hard to do. I agree. It takes a little practice. So if y is constant, we have to use a, well, not because y is constant. This is product rule time, right? So the derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. So the derivative of the first with respect to x is going to be e to the 3y times the second plus the derivative of the first, sorry, the derivative plus the first, sorry, times the derivative of the second, which is going to be what? One. y cosine xy. Exactly. Because y is a constant. y is a constant. GY is going to look very similar. It's not going to be identical. What do you get now? The derivative of the first is going to be 3e to the times sine of xy plus the first times the derivative of the second. What's this one going to be? x cosine xy. Chad eso. X for me. fx, xyz. What's that one going to be? 2x, and what's the rest? Oh, the same as it's up there, right? What's fy going to be? Mm -hmm. Over. And what's fz going to be? 